B-20s, the most powerful light bombers in the world. We call them Havocs. The RAF call them Bostons. And the Luftwaffe, well, they just know they're poison. But wherever they fly and under what name they're known, they're still a twin-engine bundle of dynamite. Trim, sleek, fast, powerful, and deadly. Although they first took wing as light bombers, they've proved themselves so versatile in the air that they now perform every type of combat duty and under every type of flying condition. That's why they're playing such a vital role in giving the United Nations supremacy in the air. Flown by the RAF, the A-20 contributed more than its share in the ultimate defeat of Rommel in Libya. Without the attacking power of their Bostons, the British would have been forced to retreat in Palestine. With German divisions only 15 miles away, greatly outnumbered in every department, the British sent out 25 Boston bombers on over 100 sorties daily. So effectively were the enemy blasted that the British were able to regroup their forces and counterattack. Yes, the Luftwaffe was beaten in Africa, just as it will be beaten eventually in every theater of operation. And these smashed Nazi planes bear mute evidence to the mastery of the A-20. Here are hundreds of them destroyed at one Nazi airbase, no longer master of all they surveyed, wrecked, smashed, and beaten to the ground. But victories like that don't happen overnight. Victories won with squadrons of A-20s that leave a trail of enemy wreckage in their wake. These men learn the how, why, and wherefore back home. And from the looks of things, they learn their job well. And this is how they do it. These A-20s are sure queer looking gals, aren't they? Maybe, Tom. But over in Egypt, they look like glamour gals to us. Matter of fact, we thought they were the best looking babies that had been up and down the Nile since Cleopatra retired. Cleopatra, huh? Yep. Yeah. And a one-man gal she is. That is one man at a time. Remember that, Tom. You're the only man in that cockpit. No one else is with you to share the responsibility. And that goes for your ground check, too. You'll want to make every check yourself. But there's one thing especially. You see this snubbing pin? Mm-hmm. Be sure it's in there and fast. If it isn't, the nose wheel will buckle on the takeoff and spill your plane before it ever leaves the ground. Yeah, well, that's reason enough to check it. But uh, how does it get out in the first place, sir? Well, you see over there? When they tow the ship, they remove the pin so the nose wheel will swivel. Sometimes they forget to put it back. Or sometimes they forget to take it out in the first place. Then the pin shears off and you're really in trouble. Check displacement of your landing gear. Well, about three inches. The linkage looks okay. How about the tires, sir? Yeah, they're all right. Don't let the tires depress below this ridge. Now check nacelles and fuselage for fluid leaks. Well, you know all this stuff, Tom. But remember, it's that nose wheel pin. It's number one on the check parade, huh? Right. Now go through the same process on the other side while I check the foam 1A. Everything's okay on that side, sir. Right. A lot of hardware down there. Yeah, but it just means you'll learn your checklist so well you can write it in Greek with one hand and read it in Braille with the other. Remember, Tom, the old timers call checklists their Bibles. No matter how well they know it, they take it step by step each time. Now let's go over it point by point. Number one, parking brakes on. Number two, fuel supply, right fuel selector to main. Switches on both for either engine. That's quite a routine. Well, this checklist is more than a routine. Make it a habit and it'll be the best life insurance policy you'll ever have. And this baby right here is the most important one to remember in your cockpit check. Never take off unless those upper cowl flaps are closed. Uh, what's so important about upper cowl flaps, sir? Upper cowl flaps were designed only for additional cooling when taxiing on the ground. If they're open in flight, the airflow over the wing is disturbed. The first thing I told you about Cleopatra Tom was how trim and sleek she is. But look what happens when the upper cowl flaps are open in flight. You'll feel that buffeting in your control column, just like the ships in a stall. If this happens on the takeoff, 
don't get excited. Just reach for that upper cowl flap control and close it. You'll feel like a chump, but you'll be a safe chump at least. Well, that's about enough hangar flying. Let's take the queen upstairs and you can learn a little more about her. Right. How do you like your upper berth? Yeah, well, it's okay, but I feel like a flying sardine. Remember your nose wheel when you taxi. You must have some forward rolling motion before you try to turn the ship. Okay, Tom, now you can make the takeoff check. Call them out one by one and watch me finger the gadgets. And notice that besides your regular cross-feed fuel system, you've got another cross-feed system for fuel pressure. Some models have a cross-feed fuel pressure valve, while other models have electric booster pumps. All models take off with cross-feed or boosters on. In that way, either engine fuel pump can fail during the takeoff, and the remaining pump will keep both engines running. And last and most important, get those upper cowl flaps closed. Right. And now about takeoff. Any ship with tricycle gear has zero lift and minimum drag in its normal ground position. That means the ship won't fly herself off the ground no matter how fast you get her going unless you bring that nose wheel up at the right time. I'll show you when we break ground. Say, I've never gotten this straight. Uh, do you use flaps on an A-20 takeoff? Here's what happens when you take off without flaps. Without flaps, the A-20 requires a longer takeoff run as it is not safely airborne until 115 miles per hour has been attained. Your best climbing speed, 165 miles per hour, is soon reached. On a short runway or where you have obstacles to clear, you take off with your flaps 22 and a half degrees down. She's in the air at 100 miles per hour with a shorter run clearing her obstacle at about 135 miles per hour. As soon as the obstacle is clear, up your flaps to improve your rate of climb. I'll show you that nose wheel business when we take off. Line up with the runway. Ease your power on slowly. Don't worry about getting your nose wheel off the ground until you've passed 100 miles per hour. We used to lift the nose wheel clear of the ground as soon as we could on rough terrain to prevent strain. But these new nose wheels are as tough as the main gear. When your airspeed reaches 100, start easing back on the control column until the nose wheel is clear of the ground. And hold her there until the ship flies itself off. Remember, any tricycle gear takeoff will be different at first. And Cleopatra's no snob. You can't take her off with her nose way up in the air. It causes too much additional drag, and you're liable to run out of runway. And don't up your gear until you're 50 feet above the runway. She has a tendency to settle in a little when the gear is up. Your next move is to get her up to 135 miles per hour, which is your minimum single engine controllable speed. Remember that. She's slick and beautiful. She cruises normally 25 inches manifold pressure, 1800 RPM. And now you're high enough to be safe in turning off your cross feed system. I'll bet that's a handy gadget in a spot. Yep, and just one more way of getting Cleopatra up and down the Nile. Incidentally, Tom, we brought the queen up here to see how she performs. Well, what are we waiting for? Okay, acrobatics are forbidden, but I'll show you a power-off stall just to give you the feel of it. Remember, the queen's a hot baby. We'll ease back on her power and pull her nose up. Now she's just under a stall. That buffeting in your control column is your warning. say she was a stuff, no tendency to fall off on either wing. She's a smooth
smooth pave in stalls. Yes, in power off stalls. But never try a power on stall. That's forbidden. Spins pretty fast, huh? Like a hot rock. If you find yourself in a spin at 5,000 feet or less, the only thing to do is jump. That's where you and the queen call it quits. I'll bet that's a heartbreak. Sure, but it's better than breaking your neck. Remember, you sit well forward of the engines. That means before you jump, you've got to feather both props. There's not much to tell you, Tom, about normal banks and turns. She does them beautifully. But stay away from steep banks. Remember, the Queen is not an acrobatic aeroplane. Bank turns over 75 degrees give you loads on the wings they were never designed to take. And she'll stall out of a 70 degree bank at 200 miles per hour. Getting tired of that belly buster position, Tom? I've been this way so long, I'm beginning to like it. Okay, but there are a couple of more things you ought to know about the Queen. Hold on and I'll show you how she dives. Ground strafing, remember you're not flying a dive bomber. Use power and not a sharp angle dive to get your maximum allowable air speed. This ship was never designed to stand pullouts from steep dives. Throttles at least to full cruising power. Supercharger in low. And you can trim the ship in a dive, but never use your elevator trim tabs for maneuvering or recovering from a dive. That's taboo because it gives the ship a load it can't take. thing to remember is that it's possible to put this high-speed job into an accelerated stall if you try to pull out of your dive too quickly. If this happens, take it easy. Release your back pressure until you regain control. And then ease her out again with less G's. Accelerated stalls in excess of 200 miles per hour indicated will pull the airplane apart. That's why all A-20 pilots are told to start pulling out of their dives while there's still plenty of air left under them. And pullouts should never be violent. Use steady, easy back pressure. Uh, say, Captain, I, uh, I think I better tell you this right now. I, uh, had pork chops today for lunch. Very greasy. I get it, but don't worry. The next one will be easier on you. I'll show you some emergency procedures. First, let's take emergency hydraulic pressure procedure. Let's assume your hydraulic system has a complete failure. You're coming into the field and you want to get your gear and flaps down. First thing to do is to put all the hydraulic handles in neutral. They should always be in neutral when in flight anyhow. Slow the ship down to 135 miles per hour and put the landing gear selector down. Got that? Right. Next, pull the emergency gear release. All wheels should come down and lock, and don't zoom to get them down. If they need help, duck the nose slightly and that'll do it. Try to pump the flaps at least half down with the hand pump. And that's all there is to it. Oh yes, if you haven't any hydraulic brake pressure, just put on the emergency air brake, and that'll make her behave plenty fast. I got it. Now I'll show you some single engine performance. We'll simulate engine failure and see how it works. Feel that yaw? You'll use enough opposite rudder to maintain directional control. Then feather that prop. And be sure your airspeed stays above 135 miles per hour. That's the minimum speed at which the airplane can be controlled on one engine. Then as soon as you can, get the air speed up to 165 miles per hour. That's minimum speed at which the engine is cool enough to maintain continuous flight. Then you can trim the ship, sit back and start telling yourself ghost stories. Engine failure on takeoff is a little tougher. If you lose an engine before you're up to 135, cut the throttles and switches and land straight ahead. Another thing, don't forget your stalling speed goes up like a skyrocket as a ship banks. On a single engine, never bank more than 15 degrees. And always bank toward the live engine, never into the dead one.
This ship's single engine performance is swell, if you hold her within limits. Over in Egypt, lots of the boys had one engine shot away, but whenever they could, they always unfeathered the bad engine and used it on landings. Let's say you're returning from a combat mission, and our dead engines had the oil lines shot out. We've had to feather it, and now we're coming back to the base. Now watch. First, we unfeather the dead engine. We let her warm up with its prop in high pitch and very little throttle. Then increase power slowly and use the dead engine for landing regardless of whether she's smoking or acting up. Just as long as she's putting out some power, we're better off. For the initial approach, put RPM up to 2200. Hold speed at 165. Mixture, auto rich. When you enter the base leg, flaps 22 and a half degrees down. Gear down. Then when you enter your final approach, or landing leg, throttle back to 130 miles per hour. As soon as you're sure the landing is in the bag, put flaps full down. Come over the fence at 115 and land. Hold your nose wheel high off the ground. And don't worry about scratching your tail. She certainly lands nicely. Say, uh, thanks a million for showing me those emergency procedures. You sure have a smooth way of doing it. You learn a lot of things in combat. I uh, guess you've had enough for today. Yeah, that's enough for me. And the pork chops. Well, Tom, what do you think of Cleopatra now? Uh, she's everything I like. Twin engines, sensitive, plenty fast. She's for me, Captain. Yes, men who know their ships. Men who are destroying the enemy on every front all agree the A-20 is the sweetest attack ship in the sky.